What's up guys, we're going to be taking a look at this lab, same site lax bypass via method override. Now we're actually going to go full PowerPoint right now because there's some prerequisite knowledge to understand how this lab works. What does same site lax actually mean? Now, when a web app sends the set cookie header, prompting the browser to save a cookie in browser memory, there are some specifications that are also included as part of that set cookie header from the web app to explain to the browser how to handle that piece of stored data, i.e. the cookie. And one of those directives to the user's browser is the same site attribute, which can be set to strict, lax, or none. So the same site attribute in the set cookie header controls how cookies are sent with cross site requests. It helps to mitigate CSRF attacks by restricting cookie inclusion in cross site requests. So imagine the web app sends set cookie, my cookie equals value, then it has same site equals strict. Now let's imagine that the victim has the cookie saved in their browser and they visit an attacker controlled domain and that attacker control domain attempts to manipulate the user's browser into sending a request cross site to the web app with which the user is authenticated. Well, the browser looks at that cookie, sees that it has same site equals strict set and it refuses to include the cookie value as part of that request originating from the attacker's domain to the web app with which the victim is authenticated. So the cookie is basically not sent. It can only be sent if the request also originates on the web app with which the victim is authenticated. Now, the next tier below this in terms of security is same site equals lax. This means that some requests are sent cross site, but not all of them. So all of the cookies are sent on same site requests, but an example of a cross site request that won't work is a post request. And the reason for this is that post requests typically modify back end data somehow, whereas something like a get request, which is typically used to retrieve information, this will be sent cross site, even if same site is set to lax. And actually, this is the default behavior in modern browsers. So for example, imagine the web app sent the set cookie header with the same site attribute completely missing from the header. The browser will ultimately default to same site equals lax. Now, one of the interesting aspects of this is that initially for two minutes, taking into account modern browsers such as Chrome and Firefox, same site is actually set to none. It only defaults to same site equals lax after a period of two minutes. Finally, we have the lowest level of security, same site equals none. This is not always a bad thing. Certain types of authentication cookies are actually designed to be sent cross site. So having same site equals lax or strict could actually prevent the cookies from operating as they're supposed to. So in some cases we could actually want same site equals none. But the idea is if we exclude the same site attribute from the set cookie header for the first two minutes, same site equals none. And then after two minutes, the majority of modern browsers are going to default to same site equals lax. Now, as it sounds, same site equals none basically means that cookies are sent along with all requests, including cross site requests. However, same site equals none needs to be used with the secure flag. This is another attribute that can be set in the set cookie header. This means that these cookies are only going to be sent over a HTTPS connection. The idea is that if this cookie is containing some sort of authentication value, then at least it's less prone to being eavesdropped on because the eavesdropper would have to deal with the fact that the connection is encrypted if it's sent over HTTPS, whereas if it's plain text in HTTP and it contains some authentication value in plain text, then that's obviously not going to be secure. So same site equals none could sometimes be what we desire as a developer 
but it needs to be used with the secure flag so that when those cookies are sent cross site, at the very least, it's mandatory that they're sent over a HTTPS connection. The browser sees that it's HTTP, it's simply not going to dispatch the cookie with the cross site request. Okay, so to give some context to this lab, when it sets the cookie in the victim's browser, the same site attribute is going to be completely missing. We know it's going to default to same site equals none, and then two minutes later, it's going to be set to same site equals lax. Now, the context of this attack is that by the time the victim lands on the attacker controlled domain, the value of the cookie is set to same site equals lax. What that means is we can manipulate the user's browser into sending a GET request and including the value of the cookie. But if we try and manipulate the victim's browser into sending a POST request, although the POST request will be dispatched, the contents of the cookie will not be included because same site lax does not allow that. So here is where we get to the method override part of the attack. For example, if the request dispatched from the user's browser is actually a GET request, it will be sent with the cookies. But if the web app interprets that GET request as a POST request, then we're able to manipulate the functionality of the web app while still including the value of the cookie. So that's the concept here. Let's now see how it works by firing up the lab. The first thing we're going to do is log into the account. We can use the credentials Wiener Peter for this, and we're going to harvest the login request in the background using Burt Proxy. So here is the login request. It's a post request. Notice the response from the server. We've successfully authenticated with the web app. Common procedure is for the web app to now set a session cookie. We can see the set cookie header. We have the value session and we can see the value of the session cookie. Notice what has been omitted here. There is no same site attribute. What does that mean in terms of the victim's browser's handling of this cookie? Initially, same site is going to be set to none. And then after two minutes, the victim's browser is going to default to same site equals lax. Furthermore, let's experiment with the change email functionality. So we're going to change to a new email. Let's harvest this request in the background. Here we can see a copy of the post request to my account change email. We have the new email in the post request body. If you've been following the previous labs, you'll notice straight away that there is something missing from this post request. What is it? It's the cross site request forgery token. In other words, the functionality here is not protected by a cross site request forgery token. The only thing preventing us from running a cross-site request forgery attack is the fact that the victim's browser is going to refuse to send a post request cross-site, including the session cookie. But the only thing the web app is looking at here is the session cookie in order to determine the user. It's not directly dealing with the origin of the request by means of a cross-site request forgery token. The only protection is the victim's browser. Same site equals lax. It's a post request. It's not going to send the session cookie along with the post request. Now, if you're wondering, well, what was it set to before in the previous labs? What was the same site attribute set to for the cookie value in the victim's browser? Because we were able to send whichever post requests we want. If you go back to those previous labs, you'll see that when we leveraged the header injection vulnerability to set the cookie in the victim's browser, we included a same site attribute in the header injection attack. We set same site to none. What that allowed us to do is when the victim visited the attacker controlled domain, we were able to dispatch post requests cross site and they would automatically include the victim's session cookie. Now, in this case, we have a bit of extra protection in some senses, because although there's no cross site request forgery token, the victim's browser is going to refuse to send this session cookie along with any post requests that originate from an attacker controlled domain, because the victim's browser has that cookie saved with the attribute same site equals lax. What we do know, however, is that we could get the victim's browser to dispatch a get request along with the value of the cookie. It's just that in this case, because there's backend changing functionality, 
we actually need a post request. We can't send this particular attack with a get request. In fact, if we chose change request method and try to resend this, let's modify the email slightly, we choose send, we get a 405 response method not allowed. So it has to be a post request, but we can only dispatch a get request. Question is, how do we get around that? Now, it turns out that some web apps make use of a technique referred to as method spoofing. When a web app makes use of method spoofing, it allows us to send one type of request, one HTTP verb, but have it be interpreted by the web app as a second HTTP verb. And one of the simple reasons why web apps allow this is to do with certain limitations of how the browser works. For example, if we have a HTML form on a page, we can control the request to some extent. We can decide whether it's a get request or a post request, but we can't dispatch a delete request from a HTML form. What if we wanted to dispatch a delete patch or put request from a HTML form? That type of functionality doesn't exist in the web browser itself, but what we can do is modify the request so the browser thinks it's sending a get request, but based on the parameters we include with that request, the backend web app receives that request and treats it like a delete request or a put request or a patch request. And using the same idea, we can send a get request, which we're allowed to with same site lax, the cookie is going to be sent, but we have the backend web app interpret that particular HTTP request as a post request, even though it's really a get request. So it's something that's referred to as method spoofing. We're going to be able to override the get request and make it into a post request in this case. If you take a look at a web app framework like Laravel, for example, the way this would be done is we have an ampersand because we're going to add to the query string. We simply have underscore method equals then the method that we want to spoof. So what we're seeing right now is a get request that's going to be interpreted as a post request by the web app. We send that, we get a 302 found response. And if we take a look at the web app, in fact, let's just make sure this is a new email. Let's resend that. We can see the email has been updated. We've just used a get request to perform post request functionality. Hopefully you can begin to see how this attack is going to work and why it's referred to as a method override. Same site lacks. We can only send get requests if you want to include the session cookie, but we're overriding the method, making use of method spoofing so that it's interpreted as a post request by the web app. So here now at the exploit server, this particular solution is actually provided by Port Swigger. Let's take a quick look at what it's doing. So we're assuming that this is the attacker controlled domain. The victim lands on the attacker controlled domain. At this point, it already has its session cookie saved, but at this stage, it's set to same site equals lax. So the browser knows you can send this cross site if it's a get request and include the cookie value. But if it's a post request, you can't send it. So the victim arrives at the attacker controlled domain and we can see that immediately the JavaScript is setting the location of the victim's browser to the my account change email route. Now, of course, because it's setting document dot location, we often associate that with what's in the URL bar in the web browser. In other words, this is a get request. It's just directing the victim's browser to make a get request. But notice the query string. We have the email parameter owned at websecurityacademy.net. That's going to be the new email and underscore method equals post. This is a get request that's going to be interpreted as a post request. Of course, the victim's browser has no knowledge of the fact that this is going to be interpreted as a post request. From the victim's browser's perspective, this is just a simple get request and that's allowed to be sent cross site with same site equals lax and the value of the session cookie is going to be included. From the web app's perspective, it receives a post request. It needs to know which user this is. So where does it look? It looks at the session cookie. Okay, which user has this particular session cookie? Oh, it's this user. Let's take a look at the email I want to set as a new email. Everything checks out, user's email gets changed. So let's store this and we'll choose deliver exploit to victim, which is going to simulate the victim visiting the attacker controlled domain, having been already authenticated with the web app and having reached the stage where two minutes has passed and the same site attribute on the session cookie is set to lax. So we choose deliver exploit to victim and we get the flag, congratulations, you solved the lab. 
Now, in this case, part of the issue is maybe the web developer is relying on same site lacks to protect users against cross-site request forgery. The way that we're going to augment the security is by actually making use of a cross-site request forgery token, which is completely omitted in this case. And of course, maybe the developer is not relying on same site lacks because the developer didn't even specify same site lacks. And an interesting thing to think about is if we were able to time this so that the attack occurred within the first two minutes of the victim being authenticated, we wouldn't even need the method spoofing in order for this attack to be successful. So really there's just not enough in the way of protection here. We want a same site attribute set on the cookie, either to lax or strict, depending on the requirements. And we also need the inclusion of a cross-site request forgery token. I would like to clarify one small detail. We've simplified things slightly by saying it's only possible to send get requests cross site with same site set to lax, but that's actually a simplification. You can't send all get requests. In fact, it needs to be a top level navigation. In other words, if it's a get request that's dispatched through Ajax, in other words, it's an asynchronous request, then it's still not going to be allowed by the victim's browser. It needs to be a top level navigation or get request such as changing the value of document.location. So without getting fully into details with same site set to lax, some types of requests will work, whereas others are going to be prohibited by the victim's browser. So that's pretty much it for this lab. Key mitigations, make sure you set the same site attribute and also make sure you include a cross site request forgery token. And all of a sudden this lab is now secure. Thanks very much for checking out the content. Catch you guys in the next lab.